been spliced. This is a weird rope that I wanted to understand how strong it is. We are working on a world record project right now where we need several kilometers of this. They'll snake through the air as if gravity isn't real and the energy will go back and forth through it where you feel it humping. We need to know precisely what this breaks at in a real world scenario. And in the process of finding out, I learned five things about it. So many ropes have a sheath, and then on the inside, they have a core that can look several different ways. Hollow 12 braid is 12 strands and hollow. And you can make the eye-to-eye -eye splices that we're testing in this video. Or you could splice it like this and turn it into a shackle, a soft shackle. And they come in different qualities. This specific one right here is for the brake test machine, and it breaks at 143 kilonewtons, pulled eye-to-eye. -eye. And I have been using these for years, and they're in terrible shape, and they keep on working. The stuff, this should be buried technically, but this is... Uh, some pretty durable stuff considering what I do to it. So the things we're specifically testing in this video is a whole bunch of eye to eye slings that have a bromel splice. We have three millimeter all the way up to 10 millimeter. And all the different sizes of slings have the same eye, about a one and a half inch inside diameter. And for fun, we are going to test one of each color. Now we are going to begin testing these on our Slack Snap UTM or universal testing machine that we are building and it is operated through linear actuators or a screw that moves a bar up and down. And because we have control over what speed we use on that machine, we're gonna go with 500 millimeters per minute because that'll match close enough to what we do here on the other machine. Because once we go over 50 kilonewtons, we won't be able to use that machine and we'll have to go to the big piston. It is made from a fiber called UHMWPE. And once they turn it into a rope, it's turned into a Still not sexy name, but easier to say, HMPE rope. The brand names of this stuff would be called either Dyneema or Spectra, and we actually carry Marlowe's Dyneema, the SK78 quality and SK99 Max, which they do some magic to the stuff that's already static and make it more static or more strong. And we have pretty much all of that. But this is SK75 that we ordered directly from a factory, and I wanted to know how strong it is. Now you'll see sailors using HMPE all over their boats. Slackliners use it in all sorts of rigging. We have done two zip lines on this channel. Wow. The thin stuff can be used as tool lanyards. The really thick stuff is the perimeter of some of the space nets that we've helped build and is the primary line in one of the rope swings coming soon. You'll even see HMPE as fishing line but we've also used it a ton in our brake test systems as it's as strong as steel cable, but less scary when things go boom. So the first thing I learned was that the numbers were all over the place for a single diameter. Testing the same thing over and over, my, my range was big, bigger than I thought it was going to be. Now, if you are testing knots, knots add a lot of variables into a rope, and therefore I tend to get a big, range or deviation between the samples. But the way we tested this, which I think is important to understand, is that we brummeled eye splice. A simple eye splice is where you just take the tail and you go straight down the center of it. And if it's not under load, it could easily come out. A brummeled eye splice is where you take the opposite end and feed it through first, then you stick the tail in, and then you bury it. And that basically gives you the maximum strength that you're gonna get out in the wild, having an eye to an eye whenever you use this thing. Now, sometimes they might test these things in diverters to where there's no splices and no knots, no whatever, but that's not practical for what I'm trying to learn here. So after splicing them correctly and doing a proper taper, which we have an entire video on how tapers work and how important they are or are not, we, our range was still pretty big. We were getting a little bit more than 5% when we were testing our slings. Now, when we were brake testing our brake test machine, Oh my God, it's gonna continue! We were able to do our first experiment testing the speed and how much that matters. And when we pull it very slowly, we get a different number. So the rate in which you pull matters. So when I did test all these samples on the brake test machine that's vertical, that we did 500 millimeters per minute because that is essentially the same speed I get on this horizontal brake test machine, which is stronger than that one currently. But if you were to quickly pull them or very slowly pull them, that can affect your numbers. 
which means out in real life, you're not always going to get the number that you see, which is frustrating that it's hard to predict uh, how much strength you have, which is part of why you have a safety ratio. You always want to have um, some buffer, some cash in the bank, some three to one, two to one, five to one, 10 to one if you're a firefighter, right? So you want your gear to be three times stronger than what you're actually going to be putting on it for the things you don't know what you don't know what you don't know. But when you're rigging world records and pushing basically the limit of gear plus the limits of humans, our safety ratios for some of the rope swings and highlines we've done were the joke is 0.9. So it broke lower than what we actually put out in the wild. We've had a 1.9 safety ratio on some rope swings and some world records were like 1.3. It's just not very high safety margin. So we actually have to know how strong this stuff is. So the second thing I learned is the difference between one diameter and the other and what it was breaking at wasn't linear or wasn't exponential. It felt random. You would think that there would be a big difference between three and four millimeter and not that much of a difference between nine and 10 millimeter. That would make sense. But the difference is kind of all over the place. And I was like, well, is it me? I literally already filmed this whole episode and I threw it all the way <laughs> and I'm refilming this whole thing after breaking another 24 samples to get enough data in order to have something useful to share. So then I looked at the other companies and their differences between one diameter and the next and theirs also doesn't just make perfect sense because I think there is quite a big range back to lesson one and whatever you get out of the I don't know what they're testing, five samples maybe, that that range could be shifted in one direction or another depending on how they're doing it. There are standards that they're trying to follow. There's a parameters they're working with, but there's variables you can't account for. Now the third lesson had the meat slide out of the sandwich. Whoa, it came unspliced. Like I said, the Brummel lock doesn't lock it when it's loaded, it locks it when it's not loaded when it's loose. The stuff has to be buried deep enough for not friction to hold it, but this polygon shape that it creates when it becomes rock hard under tension. And it actually turns into like this key in a lock. It is not friction that's holding this thing, but you have to have enough of those keys and locks holding it in place to overcome the lack of friction. And so if it's not buried enough, it slips out, even if it's brummeled. Now we have 60 centimeter slings that can only be buried so much before the tails are touching. And so I wanted to know if those were super good enough. And they were until you got to eight millimeters where the meat basically slid out of the sandwich. But albeit pretty high force, it's just not full strength. But what's crazy to me is that they sometimes held. So essentially we we're getting full strength it, if it held, that's not good. <laughs> so the length of berry you're supposed to have is 60 times the diameter. So if you have a 10 millimeter diameter here, you need 600 millimeters of berry. And so you can have 60 centimeter slings up to a certain diameter. But once it's fat enough, it has to be buried deeper and longer. It's interesting that sometimes it held and not, it wasn't consistent. I guess that's the theme of the whole video. It is nice to see though, if you do bury it properly and taper it properly that you do get um, super consistent enough. And that leads me to my fourth lesson. What the hell is ABS, average breaking strength? That is a common number you'll see with HMPE and Dyneema products out there. They have an average breaking strength. I'm actually really familiar with average breaking strength being one of the numbers that you look at on these spreadsheets. And for this stuff, you can look at the mean, which is the average breaking strength. Not helpful. Let me explain to you why that's so frustrating because what you're used to seeing on a carabiner, for example, is 22 kilonewtons and that's the MBS. That's a minimum breaking strength done from three sigma calculations. Let's say you have five samples and you wanna calculate a 99% chance that it'll never break below a certain number. It's going to be below, obviously, all of those numbers, but if you have a huge range between them, if there's a lot of deviation, it's that MBS is gonna be much further down. If you actually looked at where the slings slipped out of the sandwich, the MBS is really, really low in order to provide that certainty. So it's much lower than just even the lowest number that you get. So that leads me to another frustrating number is can I rely on minimum strength off of these spreadsheets that you get with these products? Because I kind of want to have an MBS based on three sigma, based on what I 
do with all my gear. And I do want to kick this horse as I go by. Uh, three Sigma Math MBS woo, uh, is the worst number you're going to get in the best case scenario you use the gear. Also not helpful, but I just like to kick that as I go by. But we're not even getting that number. I think we're just getting the minimum and the average. I think with this product, the deviation's too big. So if you actually did a proper MBS based on three Sigma, I, you're going to be um, lower than people want when they go to purchase the rope. So average and minimum are more convenient. And if one company does it, then all the companies have to do it because it has to be apples for apples or one, you can't compare between them. And if one's marketing that way, they all need to market that way. So then do I market this that way? Well, what I'm trying to do here is show you all my numbers and all the math so you can make all the decisions you need to. The fifth lesson I learned is how I can maybe predict what a breaking strength is. I wanted to see if I could figure out what the number would be before I actually pulled on the sample, which was a fun game. But you obviously can't do it off of the diameter because you just go from four to five millimeter, but you should maybe go off volume. I thought the theoretical volume between three and four millimeters should that difference be the difference you get between the mean breaking strength and the next mean breaking strength. Because if you go off MBS, you're taking deviations into consideration and that's not helpful. Mean to mean from volume to volume actually did not give me the numbers the best way. So we kind of did it off a of weight because this is hollow. How much material is in this? And if you do it off of weight, I think worked close enough. So if I wanted to calculate what 11 millimeter would be in this stuff, I think I can do it. Why I want to predict this is my buddy just ordered 20 millimeter or three quarter inch from us. That will be arriving soon. And I don't even know if I could break it. So it's nice to be able to predict what it will break at just by being able to weigh it. And if you want to order a specific color that we don't have or a specific diameter that we don't have, regardless of size, uh, we can get that to you within four to six weeks. So the conclusion is if you bury it 45 times the diameter, or bigger, ideally 60 or bigger, if you really want to guarantee it won't slip out, you taper it super good enough that you're going to get these numbers. And you can go off of the mean, you can go off the minimum, or you can go off the sigma three minimum breaking strength. And you can make that decision for yourself, but knowing this stuff will help me be as sketchy as possible while still being able to live to tell the tale.